Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics Podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is gaining pricing power in logistics with my friends Chip Humitz and Scott Warniak. How's it going, Chip? How's it going, Scott? It's good. Doing well, thanks. Yeah, doing well. Thanks for having us. So, Scott, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Yeah. So, my name is Scott Warniak. I am the executive producer and partner at Lunar North. Lunar North, on the face of it, we're a design studio, but how we differentiate ourselves and what we do is we really use motion to craft brand journeys, and we combine traditional brand design with motion thinking. Our studio has been around for 11 years, and we are stationed in Ferndale, Michigan, just about 15 minutes north of Detroit. For those of you who are not in the Detroit metro area, that is usually called fashionable Ferndale, because that's where all the yes. cool kids live. <laughs> so, Chip, please introduce yourself. Chip Humitz. I work with Scott at Lunar North. Uh, I'm primarily involved with Lunar North, the, the branding and strategy projects. As Scott mentioned, Lunar North is design studio mostly, but what we've realized is that design is a big part of developing brands. And so we're trying as hard as we can to, to grow the business at Lunar North to include not just standard design stuff, but also developing brand strategies for companies. Yep. And um, I'm talking to both of you guys today. And normally I talk to logistics and supply chain people, but um, we were talking the other day. One of the big challenges in the transportation, logistics, warehousing space is the nature of our pricing. Nobody seems to have pricing power. Everybody is commodity pricing. And we'll get into a little more what commodity pricing is. But the short course is your truck going from Detroit to Atlanta is worth no more than the other truck going from <laughs> Detroit to Atlanta. And what we've seen everywhere in our personal life, if you pay attention, there are brands and brands have pricing power. If you don't have a brand, you don't have pricing power. And I can say this, I come from an engineering background and a supply chain background and then a logistics background. I have I guess I'm a marketer now, but I feel like um, in the past, we would look at branding as nice to have, if you can have it maybe, but you don't really need it. You can just run your business without it, which is how logistics runs. Most logistics companies don't have the time or the money or even the inclination to build a brand. <laughs> so I want to get, I want you to, I want to hear from you first, Chip, then I want to hear your two cents, Scott. Yeah, I think brands are really, unfortunately, an overlooked part of business. Frequently, you get people talking about brands as being logos or fonts or things like that, the way it's the very basic stuff, the reality. And I don't know who said this, but someone smarter than I said that a brand is the salesman who's there before the salesman is there. Exactly. Scott, your two cents? Yeah, I think especially in a world where it is so commodity driven, figuring out ways to differentiate yourself and ways that you can really show your unique value that you can bring to to whatever market that you're in is really the biggest way to set yourself apart and be something different compared to your competitor. If I could just jump in, Joe, real quick, too. I think it's easy to look at a category and say, it's, we've just got to be for everybody. But the reality is, as Scott had said, differentiation is the key. Finding that small niche that you do, the thing that makes you unique, creates unique value, is really the basis for good branding. And sometimes it's not it's not the big cure cancer, save the world kind of stuff. It's little stuff. And you'd be surprised at how many customers there are out there for that. And when you get to that point, you can stop fighting on price. You can start to drive prices up and increase your margins. And I think when you talk about taking control of pricing, having a good brand is a pretty good place to be to do that. Yep. Yep. Scott, who is the sweet spot for Lunar North. And I, by the way, I know you've worked with logistics companies, so I know that's one of your sweet spots. And I know you've worked with some of the big trucking companies. So what are you doing for these companies when you're developing a brand and some of the other work you're doing for them? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it, it all comes down to yeah, that differentiation. That how are you going to be different than your competitors? And so we've worked on you know projects as far as various fleet management softwares and like helping companies really visualize the, the tools that their softwares can do for these fleet managements, like what their approach is and really how to set themselves apart from other companies that are doing very similar things, but using these videos and these marketing tools to help really set themselves apart from their competitors. We've worked with trucking companies, like you mentioned, and thinking about in a world where we are just 
constantly bombarded with screens and content to the point where they're in our vehicles now. So we worked with some large trucking companies to figure out, okay, what is happening with the user interface in their vehicles? And like speaking with them internally, with their team, speaking to their drivers and really discussing like what the future of these interfaces in the vehicle can be and how does the brand help solve some of that? And how do you really make sure that the experience that you have with this vehicle is not only the actual look and feel and the drive quality and the ride quality of it, but what is that interface like when you're in the vehicle? And then going even past that, we've worked on projects like getting into the nitty gritty of multimodal logistics. And we we love learning more about that and how it impacts the supply chain. So we worked a lot with New Lab. They're a, a venture platform company and they help startups and industry leaders and investors like specifically in the energy and mobility and sort of material world. And so especially in that mobility, there's a lot of logistics in there. And so we've just recently been working on a project with them covering multimodal logistics and how that can really help build some of that supply chain resilience. And we're able to use all of the research that they've done and all the strategy that SHIP has helped us with and everything to take all of that and distill down these really large ideas and these hard to understand concepts and bring them into a more branded, cohesive, tight package that people can understand that maybe can only scratch the surface of some of those things. And Chip, over the weekend, we were texting back and forth about different brands. And one of them was Yeti. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, Yeti makes coolers. And I think they also make those big giant (laughs) coffee cups. I don't know what you call them, thermal cups that people walk around with. And if you look, Yeti coolers cost $280, $300. $280, $300. It's ridiculously, I'm, I'm wrong. People are willing to pay it. I know, Chip, you have some Yeti stuff, so I don't be insulting. But Yeti gets $300 for a cooler. And me, myself, I've got Costco coolers. And <laughs> I could probably buy seven or eight for $300. But they've built a brand. And, and, and so people are willing to spend on it. I know you have some Yeti stuff. So please explain how that, and by the way, it's not just Yeti. There's a dozen brands all of us can quickly name where you'll pay extra for their product because you believe something about that product that is beyond the commodity. Yeah. And I think it it goes to what we were talking about a little bit earlier with understanding who your audience is. There's for for sure going to be people who are going to buy styrofoam coolers. There will never be a shortage of those people. But what Yeti did was obviously they're not a staff from cooler. They decided they were going to charge $300 for coolers, but they also affiliated themselves with the people that most people would think need a great cooler, which are these adventurers and outdoorsmen. They were the ones, fishermen as an example, or heavy duty campers hauling these things out into the deep blue sea or the back country. So they appealed to people who are looking for a cooler that was durable. Most people don't need ice that lasts for three days or whatever it is, but these people did. And so you got, they attracted a group of people who wanted to afford those coolers, but also wanted to be seen as someone that uses the same kind of equipment as these people that Yeti affiliated themselves with. But I would also say Yeti makes, um, they move from coolers to single-use drink mugs, coffee mugs. They make dog bowls. They make ice scoops. They make uh, bottle openers. And guess what? They're charging a huge premium for all of that stuff. I think their scoops, little whatever, cast aluminum scoops sell for 30 or 50 bucks. It's insane. (laughs) But they're selling them. And to your point, building that Yeti brand has allowed them to charge that price, which then turns into huge margins on the bottom line. So it's a frou-frou, nice to have thing. If you're a a business owner and you say, I don't need a brand, you're leaving money on the table. Because again, in this business, people just say, what does it, what will a truck go from this point to this point? Or what, what does it cost for me to put my stuff in your warehouse and have you pick, pack and ship it? Yeah, I'll tell you, Joe. And they don't value your service any more than they value my service. No, and I'll tell you, I've worked on the Coleman brand, who also makes coolers, by the way. They don't charge $300 for them, and they're nice coolers. But Coleman makes a lot of other things, too. And I think when you think about the Coleman brand, it's about the outdoors. Yeti is specifically about keeping things 
cold in the worst possible conditions. They've focused their brand very tightly on one thing. And I would say that in the logistics space, it's the same rules apply. Figure out what it is that you do that is very unique and focus on it. It may be one of the 10 things you do. It's it's going to have an, an audience. Yep. So Scott, what's your favorite brand story besides logistics for now? <laughs> I think it's funny, like talking about like the power of brand in a world full of commodities. The one that we were talking about earlier, even is just milk and just you go to the grocery store, it's all milk and you have your different percentages of milk and all everything like that. But then you get certain brands like Fairlife and things like that just have figured out how to differentiate themselves and market themselves in a way that people seek that out. I think it was McDonald's when they had just the milk in the little cardboard containers. They weren't selling much milk. They switched it to like the character driven plastic, the hamburger milk, exactly. And milk just started exploding and they were selling more and more of it. So I think there is the power of how can you differentiate yourself? How can you set yourself apart? And if you do it in the right way and you can really follow your brand's true north, then you can really set yourself apart and become a brand in a sea of commodities. Yep. I talked to vice president of safety at Ruan Trucking out of Des Moines, Iowa. And he said something on my podcast probably a year ago. He said, Joe, we are never, ever the lowest price. He said, we're the safest. We hire the best drivers. We do the best scheduled maintenance. We have the best trucks. We go out of our way to build a family environment. And he said, and as a result, we get more. And he said, we don't get more money because we said so. We get it because people buy because we have similar values. They look at us and say, those guys do it right. We do it. That's why we're buying from them. And I talked to Joyce Brenny from Brenny Trucking. She's up in Minnesota. They move a lot of like granite and the granite gets made for monuments that you might be shipping to a museum. And she said, it's different kind of work. It's heavy it's a heavy haul sometimes, but it's also fragile. And she said, that's all we do. And it's higher care products. It's mission critical. And she said, we, I don't know, I, I believe I didn't get into it, but I believe they're probably getting the price for that. While most trucking companies, most freight brokerages, 3PLs, warehouses, find themselves almost by default in a place where they don't have pricing power, where someone says, hey, somebody just called in their $50 cheaper than you, so I'm going to go with them. I'll, I'll throw one more example out. I just saw today, which I thought was really interesting. It was for a uh, environmental group uh, that was trying to raise awareness of people doing things that were good for the environment. And it was essentially, the visual was what looked to be a sushi roll, but you could see that it was made with plastic bags, grocery bags. And it said, what's in the sea is what you eat. And you think about that for a second. The idea of being environmentally conscious to save the world, to save the earth, is a pretty tall order that a lot of people, nobody's going to disagree with that. But the reality is that people care about themselves more than they care about the environment, right, the world. So if you talk about eating sushi made from garbage bags, it's like personal destruction, not the destruction of the earth. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to switch gears. I want to talk about, we've talked about why commodity is bad, why we don't have pricing powers, because we are, for the most part, a commoditized industry where nobody has pricing power. And during COVID, everybody had pricing power in the trucking space, in the warehousing space. If you're a freight broker, the money was plentiful. Since then, it's been a freight recession. And nobody has pricing power. And everybody's looking for how do I get a neck? How do I save a nickel? How do I save a penny? How do I get any sort of margin relief here? The idea of building a brand is not usually the first thing we think about, but it should be one of the things we think about. But Scott, please elaborate. Then Chip, I want to hear from you too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the gravitational pull like to win on pricing is super strong, but it's a very short term solution that really just slowly erodes at your margins. So, you know, like, and over the long term, making like your company irrelevant and fighting to stay afloat on those thin ice margins really starts to add up. So to us, like creating a brand is really that solution. And when you think about creating that brand and bringing up that awareness even of just your company and how it's different, the world has changed so much for brands and marketing. There's just been this 
explosion of channels from traditional broadcast channels to digital channels to websites, social media, influencers, and even podcasts like this one. The amount of channels for your brain to live in out there has just exploded over the recent years. And then on top of all of that, now you also have AI, that something is just incorporated into everything that we do. And brands are trying trying to figure out how to utilize AI and how they can help it from a marketing standpoint or differentiation standpoint. So it's become a very challenging thing of not only setting yourself apart in a sea of competitors, but then how do you actually maintain what your brand is all about amongst all of these different channels? I got to tell you, I asked, I won't to criticize any of the AI platforms, but I used one of them and I said, what is the, one of the very best logistics podcasts? And mine was on that list. And I was like, correct. <laughs> yes. Good job, AI. And then I asked another one and it didn't have me on the list. And I was like, what the? F is going on here. <laughs> so then I asked it, why isn't this one on there? And it said, oh, this is one of those that could easily be on that list, blah, blah, blah. Give me some BS answer. I hope it corrects itself. But anyway, getting back to it, wouldn't it be interesting if your brand was always the one that when somebody asked AI, it was like, yeah, you got to go with Lunar North. Those guys know what they're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I think all the different tools that are out there now, like it does make it a little bit easier to create content and put it out into the world. But I think that also can slowly erode at your brand and kind of just putting content out there is step one, but just, but then making sure that you can own your space and really be unique in your space only is always better than many. So if you can be the only one doing something and not have to compete so much on the price and really differentiate yourself as a brand and have that that vertical that you're going to stick within and knowing that this is what your brand is all about, like that's huge. Within all this chaos of different channels and different ways of creating content, one thing that is consistent across all of this is that steady shift of all of our behaviors, everything that we do, everything is on a screen. Think about how often you're using your phone, you're watching TV, again, screens in a vehicle, the screens are just everywhere. They are a part of our lives and our ability to interact with these screens everywhere. We're constantly watching things. We're constantly tapping on things, pinching to Zoom, or even just typing. It's all digital and it's all on a screen. And by having all of this content on screens around us all the time, there's an expectation from people interacting with those for that that content to be dynamic and for it to move and be engaging. Yep. Yep. Chip, talk about the opposite of commodity pricing, which I would assume is differentiated pricing. How do we get to that? I think Scott hit on it. The idea of being perceived as the only is a pretty good start. And one, you can invent the only thing. Um, I think when you think about log- well, logistics space, this is a pretty established category. So you have to find your only in that unique thing you do. And that's how you get the opposite of commodity pricing. You get, you control your pricing. And if you're the, if you're perceived to be the only one doing something, moving monuments, whatever, you told that story about that that company that does, that's pretty interesting. And if somebody's looking to do that, if you're the only one, you can pretty much charge what you want to do for that. The other thing that, that Scott touched, I think that's also important here is Building a brand starts with figuring out your true north, the thing that you do that creates unique value in the marketplace. The second step is to continually telling that same story. When you talk about, when you say, what are some of the brands that can charge what they want? You know who they are. You think about the Coca-Colas and the Apples of the world. And those are brands whose story has pretty much stayed the same year over year. There's a great quote. A great brand is a story that's never completely told. That's where you've got it. One, you've got to get what that story is, make it relevant, and hopefully be the only one doing it. And then find a way to tell that story consistently over time. And as Scott mentioned, there's so many channels now and everything is on a screen. That's the place where Lunar North is really focusing. Find a way to make it easy for companies to tell the same story, the same relevant story over and over again. And if you get to that place, I'm not, my marketing friends will, hate me for this, but marketing kind of becomes a cruise control thing. If you've got a story that just needs to be told evolving over time, it gets to be much easier. And honestly, you probably can reduce your marketing spend over time if you're continually telling the same story. So where it might mean a lot of work to get to a, your story, 
although we don't think it is. The long term of that is that you're going to make it much easier to do marketing. Yep. And by the way, I know there's people listening to this podcast who are saying, yeah, well, that, that works in B2C. This is B2B. It's just, it doesn't work here. And I can tell you this just because I'm getting older and I've seen the world change. When Chip and I were kids, our phones were on the wall in the kitchen. <laughs> you didn't take it to bed with you ever. <laughs> and it didn't do anything other than let you talk to people. It could do nothing other than that. And I felt like they were just assigned. I don't, I never bought one of those phones, but I feel like they were just assigned to, you just got this phone. Ma Bell gave you a phone and that was it. It was the least sexy, the least cool product imaginable. There's nothing more boring than your phone. And then flash forward to Apple where people are like, yeah, I'm sleeping in the street overnight so I can be the first to have that Apple phone. You're like, what? Makes no sense. And coffee's the same way. When I was a kid, coffee was coffee. It didn't, people have joked about how bad coffee, oh, this is horrible coffee. I come here every day. And then all of a sudden, Starbucks and others started saying, yeah, it's six bucks and it's fancy and you'll have this whole experience. Coffee could not be more of a commodity in the early 80s. Phones could not have been more of a commodity. It is possible possible, if you want to build a brand, I would say in virtually any business. It's hundred percent true. I worked, I spent a fair amount of time working for a manufacturer of fleet vehicles was those strictly B2B. And we repositioned the brand. They sold vehicles to all manner of different types of businesses. But what was unique was the range of types of vehicles that were produced. And that's what we based the branding on was no matter what business you were in, there was something for you. Now we worked with upfitters to make this very real for everybody, but that was a B2B business that created a brand about accessibility. It works. It works. Scott? No, absolutely. I just wanted to chime in and say, like, I would say the majority of the work that we do here at Lunar North is helping companies communicate with the B2B side of their businesses. We don't do a ton of B2C and I think that's another area where you can really differentiate and figure out, okay, if you are doing like B2B type business and you want to get a certain buyer, okay, yes, price is going to be something that you're going to have to negotiate. But if it's price and then you also can find like a lot of what your company does very uniquely, have that vertical about just about what it is that sets you apart, how do you communicate that? How do you speak to other people about that? And that's all part of the brand. It's so much more than just how it looks and just how what colors you're using. It's how you speak about your own brand and how you talk about things and how you can really set yourself apart from your competitors. Yeah, I just want to just real quick, Joe, say that what's, what Scott talks about is so important. I think there's a real misperception that when you talk about branding, you're talking about logos or type fonts. It's just, it's, honestly, if you had a bad logo, but had a, you could have a bad logo and a great brand, that's probably a better position to be in. But the brand is really just the start. It's how you support that brand and convince your audiences that you're unique and you create unique value. Yep. Yep. Years ago, Chip, you told me to read a book that was, I think it's called The Brand New World. And it was about a guy who had worked He grew up, yeah, he worked at Starbucks and Nike, but he grew up, his dad was a Cadillac salesman. And Cadillac used to be the ultimate, you made it. If you bought yourself a Cadillac, you had arrived. We don't feel that way anymore. Now you see a Cadillac, you're like, yeah, it's a nice car. See a Lincoln, nice car. And then you go, oh, but look at that. That's a Mercedes or that's, (laughs) that's whatever. They lost those positions. But Nike and Starbucks, this guy worked at both and he wrote a book about it. And it was very interesting to see how they built those brands and they get this guy's perspective on it. And I remember there were certain things that they did at Nike. I think they moved into casual wear for like suits, like casual men's suits, really a sour note. And then they quickly realized the mistake and pulled back. But when this guy got to Nike, Nike had just gone public and I believe they only made men's track shoes. That's where they came from. And so everybody there said, we make men's track shoes. That's all we do. And what they had to do is somehow extend the brand 
to something beyond were men's track shoes. And there was a lot of internal conflict because they're like, no, we aren't making women's track shoes. That's completely not our business. We're not making shoes for guys who lay around on the couch. At some point, and you can, I'd like to hear your two cents on this. At some point, Nike became more than the products they were selling. It became effort. It became the endeavor and the just do it. <laughs> well, yeah, just do it is the famous tagline, but their, their internal mantra that they used for a long time, and I think they still do, is if you have a body, you're an athlete, which allows them to make things more than just tennis shoes. They can make lots, of, and they do make lots of different things, but they continue. They've been struggling recently because I think they've gotten away from that, but their unique value, their only versus best, is that they're all about athletic performance, which led to just do it, of course. Yeah. And it's interesting. You see the, the kids, the kid jumping off the dock, he's in a bathing suit and he's just getting up the guts to jump off the dock into the water. It has nothing to do with their product other than they go, oh, that is it. That's getting up the courage to do something you're afraid to do. And then they show Michael Jordan slamming the ball and you go, I'm probably not going to do that today, but I want to have that same, I want to be associated with that. I want to be part of that story. Absolutely. I think they did such a good job of the process of overcoming fears or the process of becoming an athlete or the process of doing your task, quite literally just do it. They built a brand around the process and what the feelings that come that are evoked during that and then relating it to, yeah, super high end athletes, but it's something that anybody can relate to. And I think that's really where the power of their brand was, is how relatable it became to average Joe or incredible, finely, highly tuned athlete. Yep. So I want to switch gears for a second. So let's just say somebody's listening. They go, yeah, okay, I need a brand. But we already have, we're already a transportation company. We have some freight brokerage services and we have some trucks and we have a warehouse or terminal. We do some stuff for d different industries. How do we build a brand from if we're doing a little bit, 25% well, of our stuff is industrial. We do some cold chain and we want pricing power. I'll, I'll ask you first, Chip, what's the first step in saying, how would you guys help them build a brand? I think we believe very strongly in the idea of finding your true north. That When we talk about a brand, it's about differentiating yourself. So the first step is to try to figure out what really truly differentiates that company from its competitors. And you'll see a lot of times this Venn diagram when you deal with strategy people. It's like your audience or your customer, or your brand, and your competitive space who your competitors are. We feel very strongly that brand circle is the primary thing you should focus on. What is it that you do? And then you look at the competition and say, what is it that they do? Where are you different? There's going to be something different and unique about you. And then you figure out how to tell that story to the audience that's in a, is it in a way relevant to them, that do you have empathy for your audience. One of the things that I was working on this fleet business was that we knew we were selling to fleet managers who were all about turning and having avoiding downtime at all costs. So what we need, what we needed to do was make sure that they understood when they bought one of our vehicles that it was right for the job and there was going to be more uptime than there was with any other competitor. Uh, so that idea of access was about because what made sense to our audience was avoiding downtime and access gave them that. So we would start with what is it that you do? What kind of trucks do you have? What kind of warehouses do you have? Whatever it is, what makes you special? Because again, Scott said this before, only is what you want to shoot for. Being better than somebody is just going to lead to a price war at some point when somebody gets a patent for something that you used to have a patent for. So when you, when you have no competitors, you become very valuable to people. Yep. Scott, please elaborate. Yeah. And I think like my expertise, like Chip is great at like setting up the strategy and the thinking and the concepting behind like how to really talk about your brand and think about your brand. I think what sets Lunar North apart and what makes us so unique is that we're a motion first design firm. So we think a lot about how you have this explosion of channels for your content to live in. There's so many different places for your audience to engage with you. And given that, like people are expecting 
some level of motion, some level of interactivity, some sort of movement in that. So your brand can't be static content, just won't cut it anymore. If you're talking about how to differentiate yourself and how to really stand out, static content just gets glossed over right away. So I think it's really worth repeating that your brand needs to move. It needs to think about how you're evoking things, how the motion is being characterized and how your brand is really coming to life. And I think that can really help you avoid becoming a commodity. If you are very true to your brand's true north and you know what makes you unique and you know how to identify, that's step one. So then identifying what your brand is and what your true north is, and then identifying how to make it evolve and stay fresh over time. Those are the two biggest things that like we have with conversations with our clients and we really get to know them. We want it to be as collaborative as possible because nobody's going to know your product better than you and nobody's going to know how to communicate it better than us. So having that synergy between us and our clients is really where we have found success and really helping drill down and helping people find their true north. And then once we have that established, then going through the rest of our process and really helping bring it out into the world. Oh, yeah, I, I, if I could just add one thing, Joe, yep. the logistics space to me seems, this is a fantastic conversation. And I see where you're coming from with log- the players in the space, maybe not doing as much branding as they could, but my goodness, this is a category that moves things. If motion wasn't like an opportunity for this category, I don't know what is. It's, it's, I think about the logistics category and the way that Lunar North uses motion to bring brands to life, it seems to me like, holy crap, this is, it's not easy. None of this is easy, but this is a category that's already about moving. So my goodness, it seems like the branding could be grounded in that pretty powerfully. Yeah, yeah it, it, exactly. Because it, again, it is all about moving stuff. And you know what, one of the things, and this is why I think why you need companies like yours to come in and help. For me, I've always I've done podcasts with my friend Kevin Hill. We did a podcast called "The Riches Are in the Niches," and I that is an easy from my perspective. That's easy if you say, "Hey, eighty percent of our business is moving cold chain stuff." Okay, double down on that. Create some content. Go to cold chain events. It's easy enough, and maybe have some sort of deep freeze as your your website look. But that isn't exactly a brand. It's just it's getting close to it, but it's not really developing a brand. And I think we're all investing in money, in marketing, and in sales. And most of it doesn't get us a pricing power. We're still not differentiated. And it sounds almost like magic, but when you look and say, why is Yeti getting seven or eight times the price for a cooler? Chip, I know I don't want to out you, but I know you have a Yeti dog bowl in your house that you, most people say the dog can have this bowl because we no longer use it. So it's basically, we were going to throw it out. Now it's the dog bowl. You have a dog bowl that says Yeti on it that costs you 50 bucks, I'm guessing. (laughs) Yeah, it wasn't cheap. But I'm sure the dog recognizes that he's getting better, (laughs) better water, right? But it's real. We are buying like that. And I mentioned to a friend, my friend Steve, that we were going to do this podcast today. And I mentioned the Yeti story that you and I were texting about over the weekend. And he goes, yeah, I buy Yeti because I want to be able to count on my equipment. And I was like, dude, you live in the suburbs. You're not going hunting or camping or out, you're not an outdoorsman. Like this is like to sit on your patio, you need a Yeti. <laughs> like That is your camping. But he bought it anyway. And again, he's looking and saying, I need this capability. It seems very irrational. But our purchasing, all of us, when we buy stuff, we're irrational. There's a Here's a great example of that. Uh, and I'm old enough to have been around when SUVs were first introduced into the market in the automotive space. And the reason why people were willing to buy the early SUVs is because they wanted to be ready for when they went off-road. It made perfect sense. But no one goes off road. It's what they call. Oh, I worked at Jeep, and we always talked about off road capability. And we're like, and then someone would invariably say, "Most of them go, don't go off road." No, unless they make a wrong turn. No, it's it's the rational alibi that people need. Just like Steve needs to be to be able to count on his equipment, or why I have a Yeti dog ball. It's just people. And again, this is, this applies to B two B and B two C. Is you, at the end of the day. It's human beings that are making these purchasing decisions. And to the extent that you can 
make your company feel empathetic to their needs, whether it be rational or irrational, all the better. And that's really the, uh, one, of, one of the steps you take in creating a brand is finding out what you really do, you know, your true north is, and then figuring out what, where, is this, where does this create resonance for your audience. Joe, we're t- one of the brands we were texting about this weekend was Halo Top, the ice cream brand. And yeah. I think what's interesting about them is they were pretty close to you know, going under before they did a package redesign. And we can talk about package design another day, but they focused on number of calories per quart, even though they had eight other health-related benefits. They recognized that their audience, for their audience, the amount, number of calories was the most important. And so they change the packaging to reflect that. And now I think they're, they turned into a billion dollar company. But the point is, one, figure out what you do best and then figure out what resonates the most with your audience. Yep. I think with you look at Halo Top and I bought it every once in a while, I'll buy it. And the front, it says 280 calories or 320 calories. I think it's per pint. And you're looking, the old label had how much protein said so all natural. It said eight or eight or nine other things. So it was maybe overkill and nobody noticed. Look at the font when you go next time and you're in the ice cream aisle. Look at the font on that. The 280 is massive font. 280 calories is massive. And I didn't buy it in 2015. I bought it over the last few years, probably because it was noticeable. It sticks out. Yeah. And I think both of those examples, the Halo Top and the Yeti examples, I think both of them are good examples of these brands that figured out their true north and they figured out how to differentiate themselves as opposed to trying to do something better. They just chose to talk about themselves in a different way and through through the research and through the strategy of it and making sure that all everything that they were creating aligned with that strategy and making sure that they were constantly figuring out how to differentiate themselves and not worry about getting into like feature and price wars with their competition. It was about just being true to themselves and communicating that to their audience. Yeah, Yeti is never going to justify 50 bucks or 30 bucks for a dog bowl or for a ice scoop or a bottle opener. There's something deeper going on there with their audience. (laughs) Yeah, it's crazy. And it's funny, I mentioned Apple phones earlier, but I think Steve Jobs had a quote basically saying, don't try and be better, just try and be different. So You can't convince Apple users that an Android is a better phone. They're like, no, it's almost like a religious thing. No, I'm an Apple person. They, that's part of their identity. And I always joke that I'm not cool enough to have Apple products. (laughs) And I think most people who have an Apple go, oh yeah, well, you're cool enough. You can be cool like us. You're like 80% of the world walking around with it in your pocket. There's nothing that's making you different and better. (laughs) But they, they, the way that Apple talks about it is they've convinced people that that is it. They're so true to their brand and how they communicate it that it makes people think that even though 80% of people have it, I'm different because I have it kind of thing. And and by the way, I think as we're talking, get back to logistics and transportation, warehousing, I think there is very much an opportunity in this very red ocean air <laughs> space to create that brand that sticks out and gets you the pricing power. And again, we're not doing branding because it's cool or because it's interesting. You're doing it for pricing power. You're doing it because it makes good business sense. There is a big ROI on this. And it reminds me for years, I I, I told you guys this before we hit record, I never wanted to say marketing on my podcast, in my titles, because people were like, I don't want marketing. I just want sales. Like, (laughs) <laughs> marketing helps your sales. And there was always this sense. And I remember I was doing some marketing, some digital marketing. People go, oh, no, I don't want marketing, Joe. I just want leads. I was like, this will get you some leads. Yeah, but I just want the leads. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> that was forever. This industry didn't believe in marketing. And to some extent, people still don't. It's, there's a, still a belief that we will make a hundred phone calls a day to people who ship stuff. And that is the way to grow this business. And by the way, it has worked for a lot of companies for a long time. It's getting harder though. And so we reluctantly dragged this industry in and there's lots of top marketing companies now. And now there's companies like Lunar North that are saying, we can build you a brand that will separate you from the pack and actually get you some pricing power. 
or they'll give you your money back. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, you're, well, no, I, I think there there is like a fear of okay, all this design and marketing and thinking and the strategy like can come at a, a large cost and they can be expensive and it can be a big upfront investment. But if you th- start thinking about it long term and creating that brand journey, and it's more than just okay, we made you a logo, we figured out your fonts, here are some color palettes, all right, go have fun with this. Like, We don't want that. We want to cultivate it with you and keep it alive and keep it constantly changing. And instead of just having a story of what your brand is, we want to create these journeys. And this brand journey is part of that shift. And I think companies all move so fast from one thing to the next, and they're so focused on that, that just yeah, the, the return on investment of things that you can end up diluting your brand and losing that continuity across all the things that you're trying to do and all the things you're trying to build. So it it doesn't have to be a long, arduous, painful task to come up with a brand. It can be a very, especially if you already know what your true north is and you already know how you're going to differentiate yourself. That's the hardest part, I think, in figuring out how this is all going to come together. And then we'll work, work with you to help figure out that brand journey and how to really set yourself aside from things. We, we, we like to say we want to kill storytelling with brands and really build that journey instead of just telling a story because stories have endings. And we think that your brand should be able to go on forever. It shouldn't just have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It should be a journey. It's so like we think about in, in pop culture, like a, two good examples of that would be Star Wars and The Simpsons. Like they just keep going forever and ever. And they're way more than just simple stories their journeys that have created a very loyal following and audiences are always like leaning in and waiting to see what's next from those types of franchises. So it's not just storytelling. It's not just a brand with a beginning, a middle and an end. It's creating that journey that can keep moving and flow with you over time, but still stay true to what your true North is. I think your question for you related to this. So if somebody's listening and say, hey, yeah, we'd like to build a brand, but we don't have anything that we necessarily specialize in. I think it's easier if you say, we do, we move only produce and meat and stuff that needs to stay cold. We, we're a cold chain company. That's a little easier. But what if you say 25% of us is, are doing this, 25% this, 25%. So we have four distinct areas. How do I build a brand for a company like that? Can you guys, how, what will you guys do for them? Yeah, a big piece of it is understanding, like you said, what the company does, but also how they do it. It could be four distinct areas, but and I'm just making this up, but if you have special kinds of trucks or special kinds of operations, Joe, you told the story about the company that specialized in safety. That was a point of differentiation. So we would look for what makes this company different. Scott mentioned milk and packaging. There are so many different ways that a company can distinguish itself from its competitors. And that's something that the competitors can't take from you. And that's how you gain pricing control is be the only one doing it a certain way. As you said, the quote from you know Steve Jobs, it's not about being better than your competitors. It's being different. You think about their tagline, think different. You, you, what you do is you basically leverage that difference among at your competitors, essentially, to create brand control. So to answer your question, we would have to dig in and figure out where is the point of differentiation. I saw, and I don't even know if they've built a brand. They're well-known and well-liked, good reputation. J.B. Hunt, one of the largest trucking companies. Shelly Simpson, I think she's their CEO. She's always having talking about million million mile drivers, two million mile drivers, safe drivers. And so it seems that's on LinkedIn. If you follow her and you're connected to her on LinkedIn like I am, you'll see her talking about, Hey, this guy's been with us, with J.B. Hunt for this long. They also talk quite a bit about the Hunt family still involved. And it, I think they're trying to make the point, and I think it's a good one, that people stay here. They come here and they work for a long time. They do a good job, and it's this family environment. I don't know if that's necessarily a brand they've worked on, but it seems like it's, that's, it's working. That's a great example. I think that what reminds me of is the Marines, right? The few, the proud. It's you've got to earn yourself into their, the Marines' graces. And I think most people would right or wrong. They think of the Marines as the elite of the services. That It's not just anybody gets in there. And I think maybe J.B. Hunt is similar to that. I know J.B. Hunt just from seeing, honestly, it's like the trucks on the road, but also hearing about their hiring practices, which tells me 
that their drivers are more reliable. And if I'm thinking about moving something uh, in a truck, reliability matters and that and the, the guy driving the truck matters. So I think that is a brand. A brand isn't just a logo. Um, and whether or not you like the J.B. Hunt logo, it doesn't matter. The story behind it, as Scott mentioned, is what really matters. And that's what they've built by focusing. Yep. And this is something we haven't covered yet. So I want to cover this for we end. Once you've built a brand, you have to make sure you're making decisions that align to that brand. So before he died, Steve Jobs was asked a question about, hey, there's all these kids making iPhones in China and they're, they should be in school and people are not being paid well enough. And I remember he made some kind of snide remark. Everyone wants a cheap phone or something like that. And I think if he was alive today and was asked something similar, he would say, oh no, $5 from every phone goes directly to the health and welfare of the communities that build our phones. And, or we're going to raise our price and we're going to pay that directly to these people. We're going to make sure nobody who works with us is not taken care of because it would be very much against the Apple brand. I don't even, I don't even, I don't even care about the Apple brand, but I know it would be off brand. And so I think it's really important, and I want to hear from you first, Scott, then Chip, the importance of making sure that the brand, it's not a bolt-on, it has to be something you believe and that you're going to align all your business decisions to it because there is value to that brand. Absolutely. And that's why we keep harping on this and keep coming back to this so often during this conversation is knowing what your true north is, because that's really what's going to drive all of that. So there, there are so many competitors in the logistics space. And we really think like creating that differentiation and really owning your unique space is a much longer term strategy that will deliver stronger loyalty and higher margins. And all of that can also help simplify the marketing. So the idea is to create like a really compelling brand journey based on who you truly are as a brand and then make it really easy for any content creator or any marketing staff member or the intern back at the office, like whoever it is, like we really make sure that through conversation and through this collaborative effort on both sides, really making sure that we understand what your true north is and then creating a kit of parts, a toolbox that anybody can go in and help make marketing tools for any channel that might be needed. So our approach helps brands feel differentiated, but it also keeps the journey fresh and really keeps it strategically aligned so that no matter where you're going, things are always compelling and natural. And so it's not just about creating a logo. We're not just typing up a font and being like, all right, here are six different fonts for you to choose from for your logo. And it's not just about animating your logo and bringing some motion to it. It's about how you can use typography and a color palette and all the different things you're trying to evoke through how you talk about your company or how you express your brand and making sure that verbally, visually, kinetically, as things are moving, like especially in an industry full of motion, as we were talking about earlier in this conversation, like it is a system of parts. It's a kit of parts that everything has to work together and make sure that it's malleable enough that can flow with your journey, but it also isn't just set in like super rigid guidelines that can't adjust as time goes on. In addition to figuring out what a brand's true north is, what makes it give it makes unique value for the audience. And as Scott was saying, creating the assets that can help to tell that story, no matter who's telling it, we need to, we also identify what are those non-negotiable elements that make the brand, the things that, you know, make when you think about a story it has certain pillars and we will identify those for a brand you think about southwest although they've now started doing assigned seating which is weird for them we'll see how that goes it used to be no assigned seating they only had 737s they didn't do the hub and spoke thing that was the stuff that was non-negotiable for them that kept them in the air kept you didn't no no delays we think that's really important for brands too. What are the things that make your your unique value, your true north, what it is? And then those are non-negotiable. Those are the things that your story needs to be based off of. Michael Eisner, who used to be the um, CEO of Disney, has this great quote. He says that great brands are made or destroyed based on a thousand small gestures. And we think that's true. And our goal is to create one 
give the brand what its unique value is, show it what its non-negotiable elements are, and then give it the assets to continue to tell that story because making sure all those thousand small gestures are on brand is really important. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, I think also what's so important now is when you're on LinkedIn, people are representing your company. And I know I've 10 years ago, people would say, I was blogging and I would say, oh, I write an article for a company. And they're like, everybody and their brother had to approve of it. And they would just keep chopping down any sort of controversy. All the sharp edges had to come off. It had to be just pure corporate drivel to get, to get past. And, and it was like, hey, you're saying nothing. But I think the concern with that was, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to say anything. I just want, we're supposed to write articles. So we're going to write articles that say nothing because we can't get in trouble for saying nothing. Yeah. I think you know what you talk <laughs> about is the dangerous path to commodity. When you've got so many voices saying so many things and trying to be everything to everyone, you end up being nothing to everyone. I think you have to, as a corp corporation, a company, you need to be able to admit that there's some things that you suck at and that's okay. Somebody else can be great at that. You're going to be great at some other things. And that's in addition to being part of being a good brand, it's also part of having price control to be able to fatten up your margins because you're the only ones doing it. Yeah, all this esoteric stuff that we're talking about. And again, I think there's probably people going, oh, yeah, this is a little, that's outside my comfort zone. This little, it's all about pricing power. You guys aren't doing this because you want to hang out in fashionable Ferndale. You want to do this because it's the right thing to do for businesses. And again, Look around. Next time you're at the grocery store, notice what brands you buy. We are extremely irrational. We buy brands, and sometimes you buy a generic and you go, oh, because beans don't matter. And then you go down there and go, oh, but Del Monte fruit does. <laughs> There's no rhyme or reason to the irrational nature of us, but we are consistently paying extra for brands. Yeah, a great example. And you know, the listeners, your audience, this podcast can go do this themselves. Interbrand does a study every year about the value of brands. I can't remember what it's called, but you can find it. You can Google Interbrand. And what it does basically is it puts a, a monetary value on a brand. And the, the idea is if you were to take away everything that the brand does, like for Coca-Cola, which always appears near the top of these studies, if you took away the bottling plants, all of that, and all the product inventory, and all you were left with, with was the brand, what would the value be? And those top brands in that study are always the billions of dollars. It's a big number. And that's the value of branding. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to summarize the best I can that I want to get your final thoughts from each of you. So I'm talking to my friends, Chip Humitz and Scott Warniak. And we're talking about gaining pricing power in logistics. And again, this is a business that is known for commodity pricing, whether you're in own trucks or freight brokerage or warehousing fulfillment, even the freight tech are struggles to say, this is why you should pay more for us. We're doing and the opposite of commoditized pricing is differentiated price. And the only way you get a differentiated price and the only way you get that pricing power is to build a brand. And again, this is not a nice to have for companies that have built billion dollar brands. It is something critically important for the rest of us who haven't built brands that matter. You have to play in the red ocean. <laughs> you have to play in the red ocean where your truck is not worth anybody, not worth any more than the other guy's truck. And this is the crazy thing about it. That Detroit to Atlanta lane, one company has a brand new truck and a top driver and they do everything right, safety and maintenance and taking good care of their drivers. And there's somebody else who's not doing any of the right things. You get the same amount of money. And that's the crazy thing about it. We've all seen it and we've all hated it. <laughs> so if you want to gain pricing power, the opposite of that is you want differentiated pricing. The only way you're going to get there is to build a brand. And <laughs> You guys over at Lunar North, how to know how to build brands. Scott first and then Chip. Final thoughts. Put a big old bow on this bad boy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for all the time today and the great conversation. And I think really from my perspective of all of this is 
how can you really set yourself apart from your competition if it's a world driven by just making sure you're hitting a certain dollar amount? What else can you bring to the table? And I think that's really your brand and how you can talk about what you're doing and and how you communicate with your audience about that, whether it's B2B or just internally and just making sure that everything is aligned and everybody has that same true north that they're trying to follow. I think that's step one. And then once you can really figure out what your true north is, then figuring out, okay, how do we market that? How do we tell people about that? What channels are we going to use? I know LinkedIn is huge for it. So how can you really own that content, brand that content and make it all part of the same cohesive package about how you're communicating about your logistics and how you're talking about how you can differentiate yourself and making sure that it's all serving that same purpose. I love it. Chip, final thoughts. I do the, I guess the opportunistic view here is when I hear about a category that's not doing a ton of branding, I smell a ton of opportunity for those companies that are willing to take a chance on it because there's a lot of value to be gained by being one of the first players and the only players to capitalize on branding. And I, I, my, my guess is that there's a lot of opportunity in logistics. Oh, there sure is. So what I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profiles and I'll put a link to Lunar North's website and any other links you and your marketing team give me, I'll put those in the show notes. So Scott, I'll ask you of this one. If somebody wants to work with you, what's that look like? Give us the first few steps in that process. What does it look like? Absolutely. We're big proponents of trying to meet in person when possible. I think there's just so much value that can come to a face-to-face conversation. But I also realize that the world is no longer that. There are so many great ways of communicating now through video calls and things like that. Reaching out and having that conversation is always step one and just really making sure that we're a good fit. We might not be a great fit for what you're trying to do, and you might not be a great fit for what we're trying to do. So really discovering that upfront is really the biggest part so that we're not wasting anybody's time here. So really jumping in and having those conversations and getting to learn what it is that you're trying to do with your company and how you can really start growing that brand. And then from there, we just schedule more meetings and more conversations. And it's really super collaborative up front. And then once we feel like we have a good runway of how we're going to go about this, then it's all about the rest of the design team and everybody here and Chip and all the strategy team and making sure that everything is aligned and we're providing exactly what you need. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Scott. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, been great. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support is very much appreciated. Until next time, Onward and Upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.